Well, as you're giving this morning, I just want to thank you again for giving. Uh, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker this morning. Um, Tara and I went last December to Brazil with a, a group of people uh, with Randy Clark. And uh, it was Tara and I and, and Vic and Lynn Vasquez and Jeff um, went and um, it really changed our lives. Uh, not only in getting to pray for the people that we got to pray for, but the people that we met. And one of the gentlemen that we met on the trip, I had heard stories about, but did not know who it was. And so when I came back and started telling Terry, hey, I met this guy named Blaine Cook on the trip. Do you remember Blaine? And he said, oh, yeah, I remember all these stories. So he started reminding me of the stories that he had told. Um, and that was Blaine. And so Blaine really became for us the pastor of the people on the trip. And when I look at Blaine and his life and just the short time that we've known him, the thing that impacts me the most is Blaine is a guy who is a pastor. He's a business guy. He can, he can sit in a boardroom on Monday and hear the voice of God for that situation. He can go to Brazil and pray for people in the slums and on the streets. He can preach in a church in Carrollton, Texas, and hear the voice of God. He is, to me, just an example of someone that, that hears the voice of God, that has an anointing and an impact. So this morning, uh, would you guys welcome uh, Blaine Cook? Testing, 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 testing. Good morning. Um, before I start, I want to thank, uh, somebody came up to me uh, in between services and said that their small group was, uh, has been praying for my daughter. My daughter has uh, brain cancer, and uh, she's doing really, really well, by the way. She's doing really well. And he came up to me and said, you know, we pray for your daughter all the time in our home group. And I said, well, thank you very much. He says, in fact, we apparently I'd given him her uh, phone number. And so he texts her and checks in on her and see how. I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that very kind gesture. I don't know what the group's name was, you know, in the, in the church. I don't know if it was. We used to have uh, names for all the different home groups that, we, that I was in growing in the church. And uh, they were always described as potatoes, which, because they used, John used to, John Wimber used to describe our church as the, uh, the coal box, right? All the bad, the funky potatoes. So we used to have the, <laughs> you know, the coal box. They were, throwing, they were the ones that showed up at our church. And so... Uh, we had the baked potatoes and the fried potatoes and the boiled potatoes. You can figure out the descriptions of different groups just by what kind of potato they were. Uh, you might want to try the au gratin potatoes, you know. But, uh, anyway, I wanted to thank you for that. Uh, just a quick story about my daughter, too. My daughter, um, you know, there is no, I don't know if you know this, but there is no cure for brain cancer. They... Uh, uh, Doctors won't announce that you've actually been healed. She's uh, functioning really well. There's been no change in her status for probably, I know, at least a year and a half, maybe two years now. She goes in and does testing every three months. They go in and do an MRI. And uh, she just went in recently uh, for an MRI. And while she was, she's, she's really kind of strange. She's kind of living like she has no tomorrow right? So everybody's kind of, uh, they're always polite, right? Because if, if she happens to tell them that, they ha that she has brain cancer, they kind of like at least listen to her. And she takes advantage of that all the time uh, to tell them about the Lord. <laughs> I know that sounds a little manipulative, but, but oh well. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why we should just limit that to pastors. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she was, in the, she was in the doctor's office, and there was a couple there, and the woman that was sitting next to her had uh, a breast cancer that had metastasized into her bones, and now was metastasizing in a number of her uh, organs, and was, they were concerned that they thought it was going to metastasize the brain fairly quickly, and that she was going to die. She was fourth stage. My daughter's talking to her. You know, uh, just saying, oh, well, I've got cancer too, and I'm going in for, you know, for them to do an MRI, and 
you know, I'd be happy to pray for you. And the husband was with her, with the wife, and said, oh, that'd be great. Why don't you pray for her? So my daughter laid hands on her and prayed for her. And I, I forgot to, she, she said it was the first time that she had ever noticed, uh, you know, a real presence of the Holy Spirit on her for praying for people. And she's prayed for hundreds of people in the last few years. Uh, she kind of prays for everybody that moves and doesn't move. Uh, it's the best way to describe it. And teachers, principals of school, she does. I mean, they all know she has brain cancer. So if they make the mistake of asking her a question, uh, she lets them have it, I, I guess. The answer, that is. So anyway, she prayed for this woman and they exchanged phone numbers. And uh, three days later, the lady called back. She was fourth stage. Uh, it really only with probably a few weeks to live, and she was completely healed. <laughs> completely healed. Completely healed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and my daughter, after you heard that, she kind of, you know, she was kind of thinking, well, you know, uh, you know, maybe. <laughs> Come on, God. I don't understand the whole mystery about healing. Honestly, I, 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 I just know that a lot of people are well now that weren't before. Uh, I don't, at this point, I'm not trying to figure it out. Uh, let me just share a couple other ones that were really cool. I just got back from Brazil, and uh, we were praying for a woman. I wasn't. A group of, that was right next to me was praying for a woman that had uh, some other conditions in her body, and she was getting prayed for, and... She started screaming at the top of her lungs, and then she, she pulled out her right glass eye, and there was a new eye forming behind her eye. Is that cool? And, and I don't know if that makes you go tilt, but that makes me go tilt. And there was like this little white nub in the back of her eye socket, and then I got a picture about three or four days later uh, that was sent to us, and actually the eye was fully formed, uh, but it was a little smaller than the other eye, so I guess it's still growing. I don't get it. I'm just glad she can see, and boy, she was really happy she could see. And so they sent us a picture where she's holding the right glass eye next to the one that's... That's Very cool, very cool picture. We had another lady in one of the other meetings, and, and I'm never, I'm always a little stretched by this too, and she had a metal rod that went from her hip down past her right knee, about four inches. And so she was, you know, doing one of these stiff-legged, and she came up, and uh, Randy Clark has this prayer for uh, metal parts and bodies and that, and uh Every time, I just kind of go like that. I mean, I've prayed it, I've seen it happen, but I never can quite figure it out. Anyway, she's up there a few minutes later doing this, right? Deep knee bends, right? And I said, how is that possible? You know, and then she brought the x-ray the next day, and there's this big metal rod in her leg with a couple of knobs on it. I don't know what those are all about, but anyway... But she's sending us the next x-ray because she was going to her orthopedic surgeon the next day <laughs> to get the ex a new x-ray done. So I don't know how it's happening. I just know I can do that now. Great stuff. We had a lady with neuropathy there that was complete. She could feel nothing from her hips all the way down to the bottom of her feet. Uh, severe neuropathy. And she also had these massive varicose veins on her legs. And... Uh, we ended up praying for her, and she was healed in about 30 seconds. The varicose veins just disappeared. And she started jumping up and down. She said, I can feel my feet for the first time. I can feel, you know, great stuff. I don't know what to do with that, you know. It just and blindness and death. We had in one meeting, I got to tell you this, in one meeting, we had de eight deaf mutes healed. Eight Deaf, mute, healed, and then 22 other people with one ear or two ears deaf. I, it's a God that, the Lord is pouring out a spirit in an unprecedented way, folks. And, and we've got to be, we've got to be ready for what's coming because it's, it's coming. The, the Lord is, is just pouring out a spirit 
you know, I, I, I think it's kind of like the, uh, <laughs> the Shumanite woman. Remember the story about the Shumanite woman? And God's pouring out his oil everywhere now, and he's, he's, he's you know, telling the Shumanite woman, go out, get every bottle that you can, get every jar that you can. You get the big ones and the small ones and the fat ones and the tall ones and the cracked ones. He's collecting all the pots, right? Big pots, small pots, crack pots. He's getting them all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just the time, folks. He, 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 he seems to be no respecter of our histories or who we are or what, where we've been or what we've done or what's happened in our lives. It's just I, I, I'm... I'm I'm so grateful that he does, that he just kind of picks us up wherever we are. We saw people, uh, another thing that was amazing on this trip, we were down in Porto Alegre, and uh, Randy and Tara were down there last year with us, and, and I talked to the pastors this year, the church had a pretty rough year, but the meetings that we had, after the meetings were over, they had people coming from the surrounding neighborhood coming over to the church wanting to know what was going on. And the pastor said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, there's a whole bunch of people in the neighborhood that are just getting healed from all kinds of conditions. They never even came to the meetings. Right? Now, now I, 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 had, I have heard of such things, but I've never experienced that. And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, people just came over. They were telling us that they got healed of this and this and got delivered of things. So we're in a great time, folks. So I'm going to take a few minutes here because that's all I got. And I'm going to talk about one of your favorite topics today. I'm going to talk about Fasting. Even as I say that, you go, oh, I'm already feeling guilty. Yeah. Uh, I've been on a 40-day fast at least 40 times, one day at a time. No. I, you know what? I think that, that uh, so many things that we think God is so interested in, I think he almost has no interest in. <laughs> I think that Jesus fasted one time that we know of, right? Really, and that was like, you know, I'm sure that 40 days he spent with the Father, was those were difficult, difficult days. Are you sure this is the way we have to do this? You can be sure that argument went on, or that discussion anyway. But then he spent the next three and a half years of his life working really hard, serving, healing, blessing, touching people, being with people, eating with people, eating with thieves, eating with prostitutes, talking to tax collectors, and even spent a little bit of time with religious folks. Most of his time was spent with those uh, who were in great need. And I think this next season in the church is, this is kind of where we're going. And so I want to talk about, a, uh, I, I am not a, you know, I started reading all these books on fasting, and, and I was, I still, I kept feel, feeling kind of worse and worse, like, oh, man, these guys are really spiritual, and I'm not. But I already had known that. It, that was just an emphasis of that on my life. <laughs> and... Uh, and the thing that I was really, uh, I, I can remember, I finally stopped because I was reading a, a, a lot of literature on it. I finally stopped uh, when I got to the one where the guy was saying, you know, and if you discover, you know, three or four days into your, you know, fast, some morsel of food in your mouth and you accidentally swallow it, you shouldn't consider that actually breaking your fast. And I thought, oh. 
boy, that seems like a really hard thing to get. Th- uh, you know what I'm saying? So there's always, I, all of a sudden I start feeling all these rules and regulations that I can't live up to. And I start thinking that I'm kind of an inferior Christian at best. Anybody ever feel that way? Oh, the rest of you guys are liars anyway, so. <laughs> and so... Isaiah, in Isaiah 58, is uh, in chapter 58, he says, Shout it aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their rebellion, and to the house of Jacob their sin. For day after day they seek me out, and they seem eager to know my ways. Now, I, I think that, that, it's, that lots of people in the church are, are much more about form than they are. You know, they, they think if they can just figure out how, that they're going to be okay. But this business of walking in the Spirit and walking in this day and age is not about, this is not a how-to. This is a who with. You know, we're, at a, we're in a season when we're learning how to walk with the Spirit. And we're going to make missteps, and we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to misunderstand. We're going to, you know, but I encourage you that the walk in the Spirit is, is there's, you know, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. It's, it's really true. And, uh, and, and so we, I want to move us away from some formula in the sense of like, this is what we need to do. You need to give a certain amount. You need to do such and so. You need to be at this. You need to be at that. To a place of just being in love with Jesus in such a way and with the ministry of the Holy Spirit that there's a freedom in you to, to die so that you can live. You know, isn't that the invitation to come die? I think so. And, uh, you know, it, it's really a good thing, you know, because dead people can't be offended. <laughs> Let me say that again. Dead people can't be offended. And, and, and you, you're, you're going to, where we're going, I think, in this next season in our walk with Christ, if we're going to, pour outside of the church building and into our everyday lives, which is where I think this stuff should happen most of the time anyway. Uh, there'll be a freedom for you to not be offended by people, and, and God will heal you. Most definitely will just heal you as you start expressing your life into other people's lives. So this, this is a diatribe against Israel here. It says, that, it says, for day after day you seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways. Well, Lots of people in the church seem eager to know their ways, but, but the ways are really pretty simple. The ways are about just being with people that are around you. Uh, you want to know the key to evangelism? Talk to unsaved people. It's my one-step model on evangelism. You want to know how to get people saved? Be around unsaved people. Start speaking into their lives. Start Start buying them lunch. Start doing any crazy little thing that you think you can do to start changing the lives of the people around you. I talked to a young lady, a a, a friend of mine's married to a Vietnamese immigrant that's here now in the U.S., and and, uh, she doesn't even speak English that well, but she does know how to do nails. (laughs) You've probably even heard of... Never mind, I want to go there. It's a great comedy routine on nails, but anyway... By a Vietnamese girl. It's really funny. But anyway, she goes out. She lives in San Francisco, and she goes out on the streets with a group of girls, Vietnamese women, and they literally go out to the prostitutes, you know, in the area, and they go and they do their nails for them. Wash their hands, wash their feet, do their nails, do their feet. And they're having a huge number of these girls get saved. It's just, it's the touching. It's the being with. It's the contact that people want. We have to pray for God to heal our eyes and our our ears and and heal us so that we can see people in a whole different way. That we no longer regard, it's talked about in 2 Corinthians, we no longer regard them like the world does, 
The world sees them as those people, but Jesus never did. He always saw them as whole. He always saw them as not broken people, but as people that were, that were where they were going to be when they ended up in his presence. You see, lots of times the very healing you bring is people just being in your presence, just hanging out. Uh, I know this may come as a big stretch to you. I used to bring unsaved people to do healing seminars with me all the time. They were part of my prayer team. I never told the churches that that I went to. <laughs> I know that's a little unconventional, but you know, after they've prayed for their seventh or eighth person with you and somebody's gotten healed, they go, well, how, when, how do we get, when do we get to do that? What's, wh- 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 how do we do this? And it's a very simple prayer to lead them into the kingdom because people inside, deep inside every person is that desire to do right things. This isn't just, you know, those, the scriptures are written on people's hearts. They really are. We just have to help them pull them out of their lives. And so anytime you have this ability to contact people, it's what, I call the, it's what I call the fasting of your life. Anytime you have a chance to set yourself aside for the benefits and the pleasures and the purposes of other people, you need to do it. Because you'll find great, 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 great things happen through your life. Like I said, that's, you know, it's not the right prayer. That's not... It's not the right prayer that people pray to get saved. It's a lot of times it's with, it's, you know, a lot of us would much rather st- street witness. Why? Because what do you do with the people when they get saved? Typically, you don't do anything with them. But when you're with them every day at work, when you're sitting down across the table and all of a sudden you're talking to them and they start pouring out their life about their their son or their daughter that's got a drug addiction or is sleeping with a, a, you know, some other guy that they, or is, you know, they've got a, a, you know, a husband that's run off or they've got a child that's sick. All of a sudden you're going to have a venue. You're going to have opportunity. You're going to have platform. And you're also going to have a real platform into their life versus just kind of making something up or handing them a track. I mean, God will use anything. But that's like way down the list as far as I'm concerned. Um, this fasting thing, it's just, an, you know, a lot of these, and I'm just picking on fasting today because I know I won't hurt, offend too many of you. <laughs> Obviously. <clears throat> but look at the cry of the church, or if you will, the people here that are saying, hey, uh, why have we fasted, they say, and you haven't seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves? Look how humble, look how, God, look how humble I am. <laughs> Did you catch this humbleness on me? I've really got a lot on me right now. Why haven't you noticed that? Uh, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. So there's this tension that was going on with all this religious practice that goes on in, an, in the church too. Uh, I can remember going to a, a, a meeting in, uh, in England, and uh, there was a group of guys sitting out front in this meeting in, in, in England, and they were all pounding down these big Guinnesses, right? They had mohawks, and they had piercings all over, and they had a T-shirt on. The one guy who was leading the group had a T-shirt on and said, Jesus died for sins, but not for me. They were protesting the meetings that we were at. So I thought, oh, this looks like fun, man. I'm going to get right in the middle of this. So I went over, I start talking to them, right? I'm chit-chatting with them, and they're just like, they're just like cursing like crazy, and just, they're pounding down these brews, and, and uh, there's about 20 of them there, and there were some girls and guys, and they're all tatted up and pierced, and, you know, and these shirts on. And I said, hey, why don't you, why don't you come inside? Uh, you know, uh, anyway, I talked him into coming inside. <laughs> what a, and like at the door, of course, they didn't have their tags, right, to get in. Yeah. I said, oh, they're with me. <laughs> <laughs> because I was one of the speakers, they said, oh, well, yeah. I'm like, is it okay? Is it okay? Yeah. Anyway, I marched them all down front. They were down in the front row. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I thought, I thought, 
John Wimber got up to start speaking, and he kind of looked down the front row, and I was kind of in the middle of these guys, and he kind of smiled at me. Anyway, I mean, I, I, I felt like I was in the Star Wars bar, right? Uh, <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yeah, okay. Mock me. Just mock me. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, John gives this message that had absolutely nothing to do with salvation, right? They would brought their Guinnesses in, the whole routine, and they're finishing them off, and they're the next thing you know, they're leaning forward in their chairs, listening to what he had to say, and then we invited people down to get saved. They all came forward. Every, sing, every single one of them came forward at the same time. And for that moment in time, I realized that I had been healed for a moment in time, that God had healed me to see them as the people that God wanted them to be. And the guy took his T-shirt off, and he's ripping his T-shirt up into shreds, you know. And they're, you know, it was just mind-boggling. And I just thought, oh, guy, I was so close to missing that. That close, that close. Why? Because I didn't want to look foolish. I wasn't willing, I, I didn't want to lay down my life for that moment in time because I was afraid of what the repercussions might. I didn't know if they were going to beat me up. I didn't know if they were going to, you know, they were already swearing at me and they already pretty well lit. <laughs> don't, folks, don't forget that you can always know when, the, when it's a kingdom experience. It's always the wrong person in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's a done deal. You know for sure that it's a God thing, right? So when that person sits down next to you on the airplane that hasn't showered for two or three days, that's already hung over, you know that that's a God thing, right? So you need to, you need to dial up your awareness. In Zechariah chapter 7, verse 5 and following, it talks about they're talk, the, the prophet Zechariah there is saying, hey, uh, you know what, guys, you're fasting, and you're fasting for all the wrong reasons. In fact, I think you're fasting. The reason that you're fasting is that you want everybody to notice what's going on with you. You know, ever, ever found somebody that you've, that, that's been fasting a lot of times? Oh, what's wrong with you? Oh, nothing. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> but you're not acting like yourself today. What's going on? Oh, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, well, I've been fasting for... Three hours. <laughs> right. Now, you know I'm just half kidding, right? <laughs> Stopping fast is almost as frequently as smokers stop smoking, right? I've done it a thousand times to the next cigarette. He's not looking for, he doesn't need us, except he wants to joint venture with us. He wants to partner with us. He doesn't want us, oh. you know, I mean, lots of people don't want to be Christians because we act so miserable all the time, <laughs> right? You know, this should be like, we should be like the most partying kind of people in the world. We should love to be out of my, we, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy, you know. Uh, we should be the most creative, the most interesting, the most exciting people to be around because we have the living God. You know, we're not in the Old Testament, folks. We're not in a season of visitation from the Holy Ghost. We're in, in a season of habitation. God is always with us. And if God is always with us, we need to start acting like God is always with us. He, he's everywhere we're going. He likes hanging out with us for some reason. Because he knows that lives can be changed through people like you and I. For some reason, he's destined us 
to be these ambassadors of reconciliation, to set people right with God. And it comes through, I believe, through this vehicle of a fasted life. Verse 6, it says this, it's, it, Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your, f- your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with a shelter? Uh, I, I've been working with a group this, this last summer and we've been raising funds. In Cebu, there was a major tsunami last year, or two years ago now. They had over 200,000 orphans. Guess who the first guys on the scene were? Not the Red Cross, but the sex traffickers. And they started kidnapping all these young girls. And they were caging them up. My friend was over there, saw the girls in cages and ended up buying 10 of them right on the spot. Then went to the government, pleaded with the government. Anyway, he put together a program, a matching dollar program with the government. And we've been able in in a fairly short period of time to rescue 240 of these girls housed with education promised, with a school being built by the government for them, giving them land to build the shelters on. It's an amazing thing, right? Because, because one guy decided, because one guy decided, instead of just saying, oh, that's a terrible thing, he was outraged. He said, this is not going to happen. He's Filipino. He said, this is not going to happen. He went and started complaining to the government, then he went home, and then he just started raising money for this. And, you know, now the shelters are all going to be done by February. And they've given them another parcel of land. And they're willing to partner with him again. And we're getting a bunch of corporate sponsors to do all this stuff. Somebody might say, well, who cares? You know, that's only 240 girls. And I say, well, God does, number one. It's like the guy walking along the beach with, with the starfish that have all been washed up on the beach and he's walking along throwing starfish with his friend, throwing the starfish back in the water. And the guy says, why are you doing that? What difference does it make? He says, well, it might make a difference to the starfish that got thrown back into the ocean. See, we can't be overwhelmed by the... We can't be overwhelmed by the odds. If you're getting overwhelmed by the odds, stop watching CNN. Start reading your Bible and stop watching CNN. Ebola is not going to get you. Don't spend another minute worrying about Ebola. We've got a God that's way bigger than Ebola. Folks, I just, it's stupidity. God knows your every breath. I'm not, I'm not telling you to be stupid. What I'm telling you is, is that you belong to the most high God. There is call on your life. There is destiny on your life. There is a fast, a fast that God has on your life. And I don't know what that fast is, but you need to pray about that fast. I think it's everything. I think it's your time, your energy, and your money. I think you need to fast them all. As God directs you. Do it in your everyday life. Care for that person that you see on the street. Oh, it's like my, my daughter. My daughter with the brain cancer. She was at a point a few years ago where she had no money. No money. She was broke. All her money had been taken from her, just some difficult circumstances. She had $5 in her wallet. She went, she, they were driving down the street with her three daughters in the car. They saw a homeless guy with the sign out, you know, we'll take your money for food. Something like that. I don't know about you, but inside of me all the time, I'm always wrestling with, God, is this the right person? It's like, you know, they could be going to buy alcohol. And, and I, I settled this one a long time ago in my life. I just, God, if you speak to me, I'll give them the money. I can't worry about what happens to it after it leaves my hand. Oh, I'm sure I'm getting ripped off. Oh, I'm sure I'm getting cheated lots of times. I don't care. I'm trying to obey God. So my girls, granddaughters and my daughter are driving by. They see the homeless guy. My daughter drives by, and my granddaughters just went crazy. 
what are you doing? Didn't you see that guy? I know what Papa would have done. Me. Oh, my daughter turned around, kind of upset. She went back, and she said, you guys are right. Gave the guy the five bucks. She only five dollars in her wallet. Gave him five dollars. Next morning, a guy walks up to her at her school and says, how's the brain cancer coming along? Always a weird opening question. <laughs> like, not how are you doing, but how's the brain cancer? And she said, oh, I'm doing fine, I'm doing fine. She said, he said, you know, I, I had this total pagan. I had this really weird thing last night. He said, I was just sitting at home. He said, I've been really had a great year in business. And he said, I just felt like I was supposed to give you a check. He gave her a check for $5,000. He'd only... 5,000 bucks, right? He said, you know, this is, I mean, he said, this is just a little thing. Just let me give you the $5,000. It's God. One of the uh, other groups that uh, we know in Brazil, did I share this story about the banquet here? No, I, I, I lose track 15 minutes after I talk. I've got a good memory, it's just short. <laughs> <laughs> they do this wonderful thing. Uh, I was out on the streets with them praying with uh, girls on the streets, and they range from about age, most of them are in the like 13 to 16 year old range prostitution in Brazil. And they have streets where it's legal to pros be prostitute. But these guys have rescued a lot of kids that are seven, eight, 10 years old in their ministry on the streets. They do a thing once a month called the banquet. And what they do is they invite all the girls off the street to this hotel. And the girls all think they're coming for a party. Right? Yeah, yeah, come on, it's free food. Yeah, I'm sure it's free. And so the girls come in, lots of times they're dressed to party down, big time, and they kind of feel, they, they walk in and here's this banquet table that's all set out, white linens, china, silverware, goblets, food, amazing food, and they, they actually have a red carpet that the girls walk in on to get into the room. <laughs> so the prostitutes all come in. And uh, they come in and they wash their feet and they wash their hands, just like these other guys do. And they do their nails and they cut their hair. They have a changing room so the girls can go get out of their working clothes. They actually redress, come back in for the party. And then they, the other girls who've been rescued come and share their testimonies and serve food to them. It's, <laughs> I can barely talk about it. You know, these displaced, broken girls that have been put out on the streets by uncles and friends and pimps and uh, unimaginable things, all with dreams and visions you know, to go to university or to have families. And to see God just do this incredible work of redemption breaks my heart. That's the fast I want to be part of. Look at the promises that he gives us if we do this. Verse 8. It says, when you do these things, when you take care of the broken and the lost and the wounded and the hurt, it says, then your light will shine forth, break, break forth like the dawn. And the word for light there is prosperity. He says, you do these things, I'll prosper you. This formula is really simple here, folks. He says, and then your healing will quickly appear. Now, lots of us are broken. Lots of us have been wounded. Lots of us have made mistakes along the way. But the promise is, is if we start doing the things of God that he's asking us to do here with these people, the naked and the broken and the lost and the fatherless and the widows and the sick, he'll not only prosper us, 
but he'll bring healing to our own lives. Isn't that what you want? It says your, your healing will quickly appear. And when they're talking about the healing there, they're talking about long-standing issues in your life. It's not just like you got a cut on your arm. They're talking about long-standing brokenness and hurt in your own life gets healed when you start sharing and fasting out of your own poverty into the lives of other people. That's what happens. That's your destiny. And here's your reward. Here's your blessing. There's eight blessings here. It says... And then it also talks about righteousness, that your righteousness will go before you in verse 8. And the righteousness just means influence. It means when you're doing these right things, when you're caring for people like that, your righteousness makes a way. It, it tears down barriers that, that have never been torn down before. My friend in the Philippines, the government just keeps giving him free land. You build more buildings, we'll, in fact, we'll match dollars with you this month. Whatever you raise this month, and so you know that month he raised $250,000. Because the government wrote him a check for another $250,000. And then he went back and bantered. Anyway, he's raised over a million dollars in about four months for this little group of girls. And he's just going to continue to do it. I have people calling me out of this thing that are unsaved people. Can I be part? I heard what you guys are doing. Your sales guys called me and told me what you're doing with these kids in, in Philippines. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. And I said, well, sure, you can send some money. I said, well, you know, what do you... This will really crack you up. Guy's never been in church before. In fact, he's an atheist. <laughs> I said, so, you know, where do you want to send the check? He said, well, my... My commission was $100,000 on this trade. I need to give at least 10%. <laughs> I said, well, if you're a Christian, you give 20. <laughs> We're longtime friends. The world's watching, folks. If you'll just be Christian, we can change things. If you'll just fast your life, not about being pretentious, not about being spiritual, but just be really down to earth. Uh, God will multiply everything you put your hand to. It says in verse 9, it, verse 8, it goes on to say, not only will you have influence, but he says, God's going to, Cover your back, big time. If you start doing the right, these things, you start taking care of people, giving out clothing, feeding people. I don't, care. I don't care what you do, but whatever you do, make an expression of who Christ is in your life. This is, find something you're comfortable with. You don't have to be a street witness. You're just, you just are. It's just a matter of how big your voice is going to be. Just be you. Stop trying to be somebody else. Just be you. What can you do? Can you buy somebody lunch and sit down and talk to them? Can you give them some clothing that they don't have? Really freak them out. Pay their food bill while they're standing in line. They'll talk to you every time. They don't know what to do with somebody like that. Why would you do that? I'd just like to talk to you. What do you want to talk about? I don't know. What do you want to talk about? The next thing you know, they'll start pouring their life out to you. Fasting. This is the fasting I want to do. How about you? I've tried the other ones. And I have been called to fast from time to time. And it's usually over repentance of things. And you don't want to eat anyway. It brings so much healing to us. It brings so much, you know, in verse 9, it says that he'll answer your prayers. In verse 11, he says that he'll, he'll, bless, he'll bless you. And the word in, in 11 there, it really means to fatten you up. It says he'll fatten you up. <laughs> he'll feed you in a sun-scorched land. When everything else is going bad, when the economy is in the tank, when things are getting, God will bless you. 
I've, I've, I've watched this over and over and over again. In verse 12, it talks about, it says this, the people, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be, you, you, you will be called the repairer of broken walls, the restorer of streets with dwellings. And it's talking about family relationships here. That's what this verse is really talking about. God wants to redeem people through you. Even when you have a right to not have somebody else get redeemed. I was with a a young girl Wednesday night, and she was telling me her story. And her sister had been abused by her grandfather for many, many, many years in the family. This girl and her sister got saved in the last two years. They, the family found out about the sexual abuse by the grandfather and had separated the family for years and years and years. The two granddaughters went back to the grandfather with the parents and they reconciled. <laughs> wow. Reconciled the family, the whole family. So the sisters got saved and the rest of the family members were saved. Grandpa wasn't saved yet. So the girl who was at our group went to a meeting a few months ago and and, uh, there was a word for somebody with lung cancer. And she said, "That's, that's, that's my grandfather. She went out, called him on the phone, prayed for him over the phone. And grandpa said, hey, thanks, darling. That's really nice of you. She says, but I'm not even a Christian. She said, I know, but it doesn't matter. And uh, just called this last, grandfather called her this last week. He went back in for his exam, and he was completely healed. Lung cancer, right. Now, that's, that's the kind of restoration that I want to see in families, don't you? Now, some of you have a, a right if you've been abused as a child. I know there's somebody here this morning. You have a right because you've been abused as a child. Start praying about forgiveness and about reconciliation because God will make a way. And he'll put some, something in your own heart that you can't put yourself, no matter what program you go through. It's all about him. It's all about restoration. It's all about spending our lives on others. It's all about fasting our lives for the purposes of the kingdom of God. Some of you in this room at some point in your life may lay down your life for the kingdom. He may, he may ask that for you. I don't know who that is, but they, that person's probably here today. And you'll be in some, some place, and you'll know that God's called you to, uh, to be martyred. Wow. High calling. But it's all the same. Whether you're handing out clothes or feeding people soup or praying for somebody along the street, ask God to heal you. Ask God to heal your eyes and your ears. Ask him to heal you. Like in this guy I talked to in this who's working with these slum kids in Brazil. All these crazy kids running around Brazil, all these kids that are being you know, beaten and raped, and they all live in the dumps there. They're, they're worse than living in the favelas. And I said, how did you get, I guess, all these hundreds and hundreds of kids. How did you get a ministry like that? He said, oh, God healed me. I said, what do you mean God healed you? He said, well, God healed me. I said, of what? He said, well, I don't smell them anymore. But I see them with his eyes. And I hear their cries. I thought, wow. He really did get healed. So here's my question to you. Who wants to be part of God's fast today? Who's that person? Come on. Come on up. We'll pray for you. I'll invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister to you. What a great time for us to be alive, isn't it? God, he doesn't want to leave one of us behind. He's, he, uh, 
I've traveled with Randy Clark quite a bit, and he has this saying, leave no man behind, and I really believe that. I think God is in this extraordinary time in history when he is recruiting from all over. He doesn't care how old you are, how young you are. Um, I, I just think he just wants to bless and empower people to be about his purposes here in this time.